Germany, 1539. The table at Martin Luther's home seats 50 people, and nearly every seat is full. He's in fine form tonight. He calls the Pope the Antichrist, refers to the church as a brothel, and discourses about the noxious farts previous popes have let off. Real rebellious talk. As he speaks, his wife, Katharina, a former nun, fills his stein. She makes the beer herself, thousands of liters a year, in the Luther's personal brewery. And it's good, lubricating these table sessions. Plus, the beer is hopped, itself an act of rebellion, as hops currently are an untaxed weed, different from the spice mix the Catholic monks use in their brewing. As Luther continues, one listener takes notes and will publish these remarks in a book called Table Talk. Others will create beer steins showing the Pope as the Antichrist. It would seem that Catholicism's monopoly on Christianity and brewing is falling apart over Katharina's fine beer. Thanks so much to CuriosityStream for helping us brew up today's historical tale. When we left off, alehouses, taverns, and inns had come on the scene. And just as important, people had started hopping ale, a method that properly turned the beverage into beer, creating a more complex tasting product that could be made in larger batches without spoiling, shipped, and to a certain extent, even branded. Indeed, hops was the first true step in turning beer into a viable commercial product. And as the 14th and 15th centuries wound on, certain breweries started becoming famous for their beer. One major center of brewing was Munich, where the Augustina Brewery, run initially by Augustinian monks, formed in 1328. Soon, they were experimenting with a new type of strong beer known as Bach. Much as France was already famous in the medieval era for its wine, Munich became known for its quality beer, a reputation they tried to protect by passing a beer purity law in 1516, declaring that the only ingredients in beer could be water, barley, and hops, yeast being considered part of the production rather than an ingredient. While this was not the first beer quality law in the Holy Roman Empire, nor did it apply outside of Bavaria, it was a masterful exercise in branding, declaring to the European market that Munich cared about its beer. Not everyone, though, was so excited about hops. The English in particular considered hopped beer repulsive and unhealthy, a drink for foreigners, while unhopped, top-fermented ale was best for them. Even Shakespeare weighed in, having his heroes drink ale, not beer. And no wonder, for his father was an official ale taster. But beer was becoming more common in England. By 1574, 36% of London brewers had switched to hopped beer, leading to a competition between the two drinks. Unable to compete on longevity or its array of flavors, English ale brewers began tinkering to increase the amount of alcohol. London's beer brewers retaliated until England was awash in high-proof mixes, given hyperbolic names like Dragon's Milk, and English beer became thus known as both powerful and coming in a huge variety of flavors. In fact, the English market was huge, with a large number of independent brewers. This was partially because when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, their brewing operations got turned over to laymen, creating a thriving professional industry large and respectable enough to form guilds. But not everyone was happy about that. For something like seven millennia, Brewsters, female brewers, weren't just at the center of beer manufacturing, they were beer manufacturing. And provided they only sold to neighbors, it stayed that way. But when beer became a fully-fledged industry, women could no longer participate. To do that, they would have to hire and manage a staff, participate in guilds, travel away from the home to ship goods, and represent the brewery and sign contracts, all things women at the time were barred from doing. Still, a few did, largely widows who showed up at guild meetings on behalf of their family until children came of age, yet that became less common over time. Women were still part of the cycle, but now they were the ones serving the beer, not making it. Meanwhile, another group was starting to worry about the effects of all this brewing, the leaders of church and state. At first, their concerns were centered around taverns. In 1400, when Chaucer set his Canterbury Tales in a tavern, a space where a knight could rub shoulders with a miller, nuns, a pardoner, and a wife of Bath, he was reflecting the reality of his time. Taverns were a secular space where, by tradition, class distinctions were set aside and people could speak freely. This not only made it a congregating space to rival that of churches, and clerics often complained of people being on a bench in a tavern rather than on their knees in a chapel, it also was a political center. One that could be used to criticize the crown or engage in sedition, especially because, with enough beer, things just kind of slip out. Like Martin Luther at his table, or the gunpowder plot hatched in a series of London taverns. So yeah, they weren't really off the mark on that sedition thing. But there wasn't really much they could do. 
Beer was a staple of life, and by Elizabeth's time, London had a public house for every 125 residents, meaning this boozy genie was well out of the bottle. Leaders also increasingly worried about drunkenness, a social ill that became more concerning as European society professionalized and became more advanced. See, here's the thing about medieval peasants. They didn't do a lot, like they had to plant one season, harvest another, keep animals, and get to church. And that was kind of it. They even had a lot of religious holidays, meaning that if some were drunk here and there, it wasn't that big an issue. But then society started developing more specialist artisan trades, ones with business dealings, where they had to fulfill contracts and be places on time, meaning being drunk became a bit more detrimental. Some of the first concerns around problem drinking centered around young students at 13th century universities who were infamous for imbibing mass quantities of wine and terrorizing the residents of the town. In both Oxford and Paris, arguments over tavern bills broke into deadly rioting. In Paris, it led to a two-year student strike after authorities killed several scholars, and after the townspeople of Oxford finally had enough, formed mobs, and hung a few students, a group of faculty and scholars fled and formed a new university. They called it Cambridge. However, one part of the world had already acted on this problem. In the 7th century, after a series of incidents among his followers, the Prophet Muhammad had decided to outright ban Muslims drinking alcohol. But Christianity wasn't exactly into that. Not only did Jesus drink wine in the Bible, one of his signature miracles was turning water into wine. Plus, in the Catholic Church, wine is a sacred part of communion, and lots of monasteries made money for the church and the poor by brewing. On the Protestant side, they'd been instrumental in spreading the adoption of hops. Again, a substance that was not taxed and differed from the blend of spices monks used. And while he did lament the drunkenness beer brought at times, Luther himself loved a good brew, particularly if it was made with medicinal spices to help his constipation. In other words, beer had become an institution, a substance so important to European life, finance, and culture, it could not be acted against. So, it was informally agreed upon that instead of banning the substance itself, civil and church leaders would essentially tell people not to go overboard. Instead, more scorn was heaped on the newly created distilled spirits discovered by alchemists. Originally sold in single-shot glasses as medicine, they were increasingly being drunk for pleasure. There was, however, an outlier. One Anabaptist reformer dared to call on fellow Christians to abstain from even beer and wine. Drinking, he argued, inevitably led to sin. His fellow Protestants promptly beheaded him. But the 16th and 17th centuries were not only the era of Reformation, they were also the era of exploration. As the Spanish conquered Central and South America and the Portuguese went to Asia, they also discovered new worlds of alcohol. In Peru, they found the Incas making maize beer. The Aztecs, meanwhile, fermented agave sap into a cloudy beer-like concoction, which once distilled with European technology became mezcal and tequila. In China and Japan, sailors encountered fine rice wines. Wherever they went, they found drinks made from fruit, tree bark, and palm sap. But when the English landed in North America, they contacted a people who, while they fermented alcohol out of mesquite pods and maple sap depending on their region, had not encountered stronger grain-based alcohols. The settlers decided to change that. So join us next time as we enter the Age of Revolution, where American rebels plot in taverns, Catherine the Great swigs Russian imperial stout, and a long sea voyage puts the India into pale ale. And while we wait on that next round, might I interest you in a flight of the finest educational entertainers on the internet? Ha, <laughs> awesome. Barkeep, one round of Nebula for me and my friends. Oh, and if you could put that on Curiosity Streams tab, that would be amazing. Not only can you get all of our shows on Nebula without ads like this one, but we've been building up a pretty nice collection of extra content over there as well. I've done videos breaking down the openings of both Bioshock and Cowboy Bebop. Can't wait for that inevitable crossover, by the way. My erroneously titled weekly podcast, The Only Podcast About Movies, explores the conversations films start, and of course, the extra history team and I were able to craft an exclusive episode on Tipu Sultan, thanks to Nebula's support. Not to mention, Nebula's home to a ton of our other favorite internet folks as well, such as Cinema Wins, Mary Spender, and Legal Eagle. And because Curiosity Stream is a fan of independent educational creators, they've teamed up with us over at Nebula so that we can offer you what, in my humble opinion, is the best deal in streaming today. Sign up for Curiosity Stream using our link in the description, and you'll get a matching Nebula subscription for free. And that's on top of Curiosity Stream's thousands of big budget nonfiction videos and award winning original series curated across their truly ginormous library of shows. Recently, I just watched what I would say might be the absolute greatest companion piece to one of our video top we've ever found. I'm of course talking about the documentary Pizza, A Love Story. 
a delicious deep dive into the truly epic pizza wars of New Haven, Connecticut between legendary parlors Sally's, Modern, and Pepe's. Seriously, everybody, I've been to all three of these places. Go Pepe's. And this doc is the next best thing to getting a slice for yourself. You gotta check it out. All you gotta do is head over to curiositystream.com slash extra credits to get a subscription to both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for 26% off the regular price. And to be clear, that is not a trial account. That's under $15 for a full year of both services. Then, not only will you be watching some of the best content this series of tubes has to offer, but you'll also be directly helping out us at extra credits in the process. Also, as always, thanks for sticking around till the end of the episode. Don't tell everybody else, but you're my favorite. The biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One for being fantastic legendary patrons.